Okay, welcome. I'd like to introduce Tag. He's here from Jawfish Games. Um, he's been in the industry for, for a while, for 20 years. Lots of experience to share with us, so I'm very excited to introduce him. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Tag. Okay. Because I don't have too much time today, I want to just sort of take you through, as it were, kind of a high level idea around what I think micro consoles might be. I think at the very early stage of the moment, I don't think there's a lot to be said about where they are exactly today that we don't already know. But I do think they represent a very important sort of movement for the long-term future of the industry, and I'd like to sort of take you through that. So bear with me, we're about to go into storytelling mode. Um, this is Angela. Actually, this is Jane, who's my wife, but for this, she's Angela. Um, in 2015, two years from now, Angela is a female gamer who likes to play a lot of games. She is not... Um, what we might traditionally call casual in the sort of five, six years ago when people were just sort of discovering things like Bejeweled. She's kind of moved on a bit. She's played a lot of iPad games. She's played a lot of games on Facebook. She's played a lot of games on a mobile phone. She's actually reasonably uh, competent and, and uh, interested in games and plays them everywhere and anywhere she possibly can. She's um, got a few sort of fun favorites. She tries a lot of different games. She only pays for her, um, she only pays for a few, um, but she likes that. She likes being able to browse large catalogs of games, get into them, um, play them as long as she likes, and then maybe sometimes buy virtual goods with them. I mean, this is all pretty much what we all kind of realized is how things work now and what else can do. When she finds uh, a game that she really likes, she gets hooked. I think we've all seen this at some point or another. We're going to uh, Candy Crush read right now. Um, but she is kind of frustrated at the same time. Um, she is experiencing a sort of sense of limitations with the gaming options she has at the moment. She's got touch platforms, she's got Facebook, she's got mouse driven stuff, but there's a sort of a sense where some kinds of experiences, if you like, don't quite uh, seem to translate very well. Some games are a little bit uncomfortable to play. Some games involve things like her phones end up blocking the screen and she doesn't like that. Some games, um, because she's possibly got vision issues or she's got back issues or whatever, she doesn't necessarily like to hunch over a mobile phone for hours at a time. She actually needs to sit back and relax. Um, she also sometimes wants to play a game with friends. She doesn't necessarily want to spend her entire time staring at Candy Crush all by herself and she doesn't even necessarily want to sort of be sitting at a table while she's looking at a phone and you're looking at a phone and you're both kind of playing together, but it's not quite the same thing as, you know, like Wii party games. Um, she's also kind of interested in doing some other stuff. She's played a lot of sim games, she's played a lot of puzzles, she's played a lot of hidden object games, but every once in a while she goes, it'd be kind of fun to do something a bit different, like we all experience. Thing is, though, she doesn't want one of these. She's really not interested in buying in to a big, bad, black, games, console, and all of those kind of bits and pieces and crap that goes with that. She's really not interested in the kind of monolith, so to speak, as it were. Um, and she, uh, she finds it very off-putting. She doesn't really sp sort of feel like she has enough time to sit and get into all this. She really doesn't know why she should bother. It's not like, oh my god, it's hard. It's like, god, that just looks like hassle. That looks like a stress. Why would I get into it? Why would I want to sort of, as it were, submerse myself? in something so complicated, and she really doesn't want to buy any more of these. Um, she doesn't want to have collections of things, she doesn't want to end up having to go to game stores, she doesn't really want to have to go and win things, she doesn't even have to, uh, any of that whole sort of stuff. She's very used to all of her kind of interesting content that she gets these days comes digitally over her Wi-Fi at home. She has books, she has music, she has video, she has whatever. She's really not interested in, oh my god, I have to go to a store. Um, in a sense, what I'm essentially saying is she does want to game. She wants to play games, but she wants to sort of do them on her own terms. She wants to do them in a way that suit her life. She wants to do them in a way that feel like another nice kind of fun device that she would have in the house and not a religion that she sort of has to join or, you know, a sort of a culture that she needs to get into or a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Or like a high-priced sort of like entry point for something that she's not entirely sure that she wants to be a part of. Um, so she hears about these, micro consoles. Like in two years from now, let's assume the word is a little more out there. She hears about micro consoles, maybe from a friend, maybe from an app, maybe from TV, whatever. She just hears about them from somewhere. And she's interested. Um, she likes that there's a lot of different options. There's a lot of different kinds of them, but they don't seem to be uh, particularly kind of off-putting the way that sort of Sony Microsoft sort of seems to be. Um, she likes the fact that apparently they all seem to run the same games anyway, so it's more of a kind of a style choice. It's like, oh, okay, I buy music and I put it on my music stereo and my stereo can be any shape I want it to be, but it's all still music at the same time. That, for her, is quite a nice thing. It's like it means that it doesn't turn the hardware choice into an either-or thing. It doesn't make her feel like, oh my god, like, I, again, I have to dive into a culture that I don't really want to be a part of. Um, she likes the fact that they're cheap. 
And she really likes the fact that, in a sense, that they're very innocuous pieces of hardware that she can, um, if she doesn't like it, if she's not really into it, if she realizes that actually, yeah, this gaming thing isn't for me, I really like my mobile phone games, it's not like she's out $500. Right? Um, she likes that the games all work in the way that they do on all of her other devices, which is to say she can just get in and play the games and play them for a while and see if she likes them. She doesn't feel like she has to get into some upfront retail thing. She doesn't feel like that, that her money, if you like, uh, before she spends it, she doesn't have to sort of feel that worry about the confidence in what she's spending. She's already had enough time to play and figure out. So, from my dinner makeup, he, she buys my movies. Um, as I say, there are many, many different ones. I was looking at how um, things like USB sticks and um, mobile phone covers and all sorts of things can work. And I thought, well, why not? You really would have hundreds of different kinds of micro consoles? Maybe. Would you have tiny little HDMI stick pluggable ones that don't even look like devices? Sure, why not? You might also have boxy ones, like whatever. It's a big, mad range. You can buy whatever you like. You can do whatever you want with it. And I think, and this may be the big, big ball claim, I think she and 100 million other people like her will do such. Um, I think that while we're very used to certain, we, we, as an industry, we like to get into paradigms. We like to think we understand paradigms. And so we get into every few years, paradigm changes, and now it's about social, and now it's about casual, and now it's about LOs and whatever. And we tend to get quite fixed in thinking that that's all there will be, that is the end of the world. And so ridiculous numbers seem ridiculous always. If you asked somebody four or five years ago, before the iPad turned up, whether there would be a hundred million of them, so they would laugh at you. They would absolutely, they would, nobody's going to buy these giant slates. Well, where do you want to put them? It's ridiculous. And we sold 150 million of them. Um, the games industry in this story will be puzzled. It was puzzled five years ago when Facebook turned up. It was fuzzled, uh, fuzzled like I said, a couple of years ago when iPad turned up. Um, Jesse Shell famously gave a great talk at DICE in 2010 where he talked about how the games industry spends a lot of time going, what the hell is going on with all this Facebook stuff? And I think it'll be the same again, that there'll be a lot of um, head scratching. And the reason there'll be a lot of head scratching, of course, is this. People will say, why are people buying these terrible things? They're not powerful. There's no real sort of, they're not technologically on the cutting edge of anything. They're not really capable of doing a whole lot. But then again, you've got to ask yourself, Facebook gaming is all driven by Flash, and it was the exact same argument. Why would people play shitty Flash games when they could play dot, 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 dot? And of course, the answer is for reasons. Um, why would game controllers get done? Why would they go backwards? Why would we not be in some timeline going forwards? So why is it that people actually seem to still like just simple, straightforward, I can get into the game control? Why aren't they sort of getting into, you know, whatever the new technological plan that we think that they should be involved in is? And the game's interesting is why would games devolve, essentially? And that's the question that always comes around with a lot of these kinds of disruptions. Why would games go backwards? Games are supposed to go forwards, but of course, that's not quite true. Games tend to, in fact, go more like, side to side, they tend to be lateral, they tend to evolve in ways that we don't ever predict. And in the real sense, they, they evolve in the real kind of proper sense of the word, which is that they find their best market fit. So it is all about evolution, but it's not about evolution in the sense of progress. It's not about sort of evolution in the sense of console generations. Oh, you know, the next one goes to the next one goes to the next one goes to the fastest one goes to the fastest one goes to the most featureful one. A lot of the time market fit, if we've learned anything from the last five years, a lot of the time market fit is about smaller, it's about easier, it's about simpler, it's about more accessible, it's about cheaper, it's about all of those things. And um, like I said, it's one we've seen before. We've seen it a couple of times. We've seen five, six years of like crazy, unbelievable stories and games where you know 250 million people getting on some platform and we all sort of stare at going. So it's not actually that unbelievable if the sort of um, components of you know, like of the puzzle can be sort of made right. If we can actually make the the idea, if you like, work. So it's a story. In a sense, uh, the microconsole for me is part of a larger story of technology and devices, and if you like life that um, people are living, that it's part of, we like to game, we like to play, we like to listen to music, we like to read books, we like to do a lot of these kind of things, but we don't necessarily like to do those in the way that we did in the 80s. We don't necessarily like them to be in position. We like small. We like tiny. We like little. We like we. We like all those kind of things. We like neat. We like easy, we like things that don't require a lot of cognitive overhead before we can even get into them. We like instant. We like to be able to dive into our game straight away and not have to go through some horrendous seven minute boot up sequence and wait for the thing to sort of crank into life. One of the things, I don't know if anybody's played The Last of Us here, but I really like the game, but I hate the start. I hate that it takes 10 minutes basically to get to before you actually get to play. Um, we like a feature that suits us, essentially. We like a feature that's about who we are. 
you know, like a future that kind of tailors, if you like, to the values, the marketing stories that we already kind of believe in. Yeah, weird. Um, we like. Um, we like to sort of not necessarily be sort of shouted out anymore. We like to be able to go, yeah, it's a little thing. I might try, I might dip my toe in that and see what I think about it rather than I will buy it or I will invest. We also like to share. So I really like the HDMI stick version of the micro console of which there were a couple of game pop, for example, is making. And I like them because I had this idea that it was just so awesome to be able to like take your little stick and go to your friend's house plug it in and there you go, you bring your game in with it. Not like, you know the old days when you used to get that big metal case and you put your Xbox in and you put your controllers and your bits and you can, it's not like that anymore. Now it's like I've got my console in my pocket. Um, we like flexible pricing. We like things to be zero and then maybe we might give them a hundred dollars. We don't like everything being ten bucks. Um, we like the idea that if I want to try an infinite camera I will do so. Who knows, I will eventually become a customer at some point, but I'll do so in my own terms. Uh, we like playful. We just like things that are playful. We like, we like neat, easy, uh, set of things. We like things that just are cute. We like things that are kind of fun. We like things that are a bit sparky, a bit weird. Um, we're not necessarily into um, monoliths. Um, and there are lots and 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 lots of people who, for whom that is true. And for whom, maybe the idea of owning a console that sits on your TV is perhaps not quite there yet, that's okay. Um, but for whom those forces, those kind of um, driving kind of um, ideals, if you like, they're very much alive and they will continue to be so into the future. There are like 250 million people still playing games on Facebook. There are 250 million people who own iPhones. There are 100 million people who own iPads. 100 million people who own this. 100 million people who own that. And the really weird thing is that all of those bottom numbers largely have been assembled within the last sort of five-ish years, whereas your kind of PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 numbers have taken eight years to get to something like about 10% of the volume. So there are a lot of people who actually like this much more easily accessible, like straightforward kind of game compared to these very premium sort of Porsche customer types who are like want to spend all of their disposable income on gaming. There's far more than you all know this. You all work in industries that sort of deal with this anyway. But the point is, there's no reason why they console idea can't actually be attached to the people who like to do things in a much more kind of casual fashion. So they aren't really like this, they're not really fans, they're not really going to get into it from the kind of general collection buying point of view. They don't want their computing to sort of be like this which is um, from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, deep thought, the giant computer, the thing that's like, you know, takes over and they like this. They like little, they like small, they like funny, they like they like cute. Um, so, these don't solve their problems. These are not, these are devices for other people, of course. They're going to sell quite a lot of devices and they have a lot of fans and that's fine. But these aren't for Angela. Um, these might be them. Now, there are some skeptics, of course, like this. They're like, oh my god, the world is kind of broken. Yes, it is. Um, it sold 27% of games in the first year. Yes, it did. Um, it did sell largely to people who bought things on Kickstarter, who tend to become more to customers anyway. Fair enough. Um, Real gamers, quote unquote, um, tend to have a problem with this kind of stuff as well. If you look at Steve Core here, who has a great name, Steve Core, um, he's talking about how, well, these are really child consoles and blah, 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 blah. And I don't really think that, you know, that the whole idea that, you know, these are to be taken seriously and stuff is something that a lot of kind of real gamers kind of pass by. And that's fine, because they're not necessarily going to be into playing Plants vs. Zombies in their TV. But for Angela, this is an irrelevant point. This doesn't mean anything at all, because she was never going to be an Xbox customer to begin with. Um, a lot of the criticism as well is essentially about the fidelity fallacy. It is the idea that people will never want to buy MP3s because you know CDs are better, of course they will. The idea that people will never want to buy ebooks because real books are so much better, of course they do. People will never want to buy netbooks because laptops are so much better, wrong again. So you got to think of the micro console in the same space. Just because it's small and weak and tiny and weak and all that kind of thing does not mean that it's a set up for failure. We're only judging that on the basis of console gaming. Console gaming is a specialist. Uh, kind of gaming form. How am I doing on time? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, okay, there's issues, fair enough, but it's um, very early days. We're in the sort of like pre Victorian era in the sense of trying to figure out what this is. There's people experimenting with business models, there's people experimenting with the tech, there's people trying to figure out, you know, should it be a subscription thing, should it be free to play thing, should it be like the hardware is actually free or sort of as super cheap as possible, is there a bit more elasticity in the market? There's a lot of stuff like that going on. Um, in 2013, it does make my story seem somewhat fictional. Oh, in 2015, we're 100 million micro consoles, so we will be. Um, but certainly the forces that are kind of leading to that are undeniable. And whatever sort of actual form it takes, the last thing 
that I think we're going to sort of think of microcosm two years from now is that the idea is simply inconceivable. You know, my God, it's impossible. There's no way the game market will ever work like this. Man, 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 man. The game market can work in a whole lot of different ways. Um, it might not fit our mental model of what we consider the games industry to be today, but hey, that's sort of why we come to conferences like this, because we realize our mental model is always, always deficient in some way. And Angela certainly won't care about what our mental model thinks the games industry should be doing. She'll go for all the things that gives her the thing that she actually wants. And which one she wants, she just has to play games. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? I'll ask my question here so I can hand you the mic back. Um, I'm Michael Bergen. I'm from MHL. MHL is the technology that's built into most leading Android smartphones as well as many, 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 many TVs. It's a technology that allows you to transfer high definition video and audio to your TV while charging the phone. It's also the, what's powering the game stick, for example, a um, bunch of other stuff. So. With an NHL phone, which is most of them, why would you want to? Why would somebody buy a hundred dollar, one hundred and fifty dollar micro console with with a twenty dollar cable that can just plug their phone in and keep playing the same game they've been playing, say with a wireless controller like um, a Moga or a PlayPad or a Green Throttle Atlas? So um, let me flip the question on its head a little bit. Why wouldn't you? I mean, the things that tend to involve lots of bits of cables and you just need to connect this to this to this, that just all starts to look like hassle. When it's under a certain price point, it becomes easier for people to just buy another thing that does the thing that they want to do rather than get into trying to figure out how to make the thing really hard work. A good example for me is my wife loves, that was my wife, like I said, her name's actually Jean. Um, she loves uh, Apple TV. Um, she loves using her iPad. She loves using her phone. She hates the whole streaming thing because although it works, it kind of is faffy. And she just wants it to be even simpler. So she likes using Netflix on the, on the Apple TV. She doesn't really like trying to use Amazon Instant Video to stream across to our Apple TV because it's just, like I say, it's just that, there's that cognitive barrier of that. This is just more effort than it's worth. So in that thing, if it was a $400 thing, I'd, I'd kind of agree with you, but for 100 bucks, people would buy things like Apple Shuffles, even though they already have other iPods, because it's just easier. So that's my answer. Anyone else? No, okay. Not that much. <laughs>